At our last house, there was a pet door in the back door of the garage. I inherited, when I got married, two cats. I hate cats. For those of you who love cats, we're praying for you. My mother told me if you never had anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Uh, I love you as a person. I question your life choices if you love cats. My wife had two. One just went to be with Jesus a few months ago. We're down to one. She is a, she is a fat cat. I mean, she's got just this tiny little head and this big old body. And so she went through this pet door and she broke the stupid pet door because she's such a fat cat. She got stuck and then she thrust her butt out of, the, out, of the, out of the pet door and she broke the pet door. Just cracked it. So I'm like, oh, great, I'm going to have to buy a whole new door. And then I found out that you can just buy a new pet door. I bought five different versions before we found one that finally fit. And I'm like, great. It's finally the right size because that one had been discontinued and so had to find an off-brand. And I finally found it after going to all different kinds of pet stores and Home, Home Depot, Lowe's, you name it, I was there. Finally found it on Amazon. Got shipped to me. Of course it wasn't Prime eligible and I'm cheap so I wasn't going to pay the $18 to get it there in a week. So in the meantime, I had propped up coolers and put like bricks against them so that nothing could force its way in. Finally, the pet door comes. My wife and I have somewhere we need to be three hours from the time I decide I'm going to install it. What could possibly go wrong? (laughs) Whoever originally cut the door to install the first pet door didn't cut it to specifications. And I am not the type of man who needs to play around with sauce. I enjoy the fact that I have all ten fingers, and uh, I just, I'm not the type of man who needs to play around with sauce. So, I was left with a dilemma. And so I took a, I took a screwdriver and a hammer, and I started trying to chip away at the door. And that didn't work. So then I decided I could just cut the plastic a little bit. And it finally worked. The only problem was this process took me two and a half hours and we were supposed to be somewhere a half an hour later. And I sat in my kitchen, just a sweaty, dirty mess, exhausted, sweating way more than I should be from this process. And I am just grumpy. I'm grumpy because whoever cut the door didn't cut the door right. I'm grumpy because I'm inept. I'm grumpy because I tried to take a screwdriver and chip away with a hammer at a door and it didn't work. I'm grumpy because I shouldn't have to do this because we shouldn't have two stupid cats. I am just grumpy about life in general. And I'm sitting at our kitchen table just not wanting to talk to any, just just one of those moments of silence. You don't want to listen to music. You don't want to hear a podcast. You don't want to talk to anybody. You don't want anybody to talk to you. You just want to sit there in silence and breathe. And that's all I wanted to do. And I looked up and I saw on our wall this sign that my wife posted. It says this, we tend to seek happiness when happiness is actually a choice. And I slammed my drink down (laughs) because it was right. And I didn't want to choose happiness. I hated the fact that we had two cats. I hated the fact that I had to repair this cat door. I hated, the, I hated everything about that afternoon. And I had a choice. But happiness isn't what I wanted to choose. We tend to seek happiness when happiness is actually a choice. There's a lot of truth in that pithy statement. And there's some times that we all need to be reminded of it. 
That we put so much time and energy and effort into chasing after something that we could just choose. The last few weeks we've been talking about stress and this morning we're going to continue that. So if you have your Bible apps, you can follow along in the events section. Just pull up Lakeside Community Church or you can go directly to Philippians. We're going to be in Philippians 4 verses 4 to 8. And if you don't have your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, we'd encourage you to download it. It's a great resource, but you can follow along on the screens this morning as we read the words of the Apostle Paul written to a church in Philippi when he writes this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. When you marry the girl of your dreams and she tells you you're bringing two cats into the relationship, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. When the cat's so fat, it busts through the animal door and breaks it. Rejoice in the Lord. When you can't find the measurements, so you have to go to Amazon, and it's the fifth door you've bought. Rejoice in the Lord. When the, when the repair that should take an average man 15 minutes takes you two and a half hours, rejoice in the Lord. When you're walking through life and life throws you a curveball, and it will, and when times are tough and they are difficult, and you would rather sulk, you would rather be mad, you would rather be in a bad mood, you would rather throw yourself a pity party, rejoice in the Lord. The Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Find joy in Jesus. I don't know that can sound really churchy or really cliche, and it just sounds like somebody who's, who's way too happy all the time would tell you. You know those people? They're, I mean, they're just happy constantly. And you're like, you're either on drugs or you are the fakest person I've ever met. Some people just have that general disposition. That no matter what life throws at them, they roll with the punches. And a lot of that's perspective. But, but here's the deal. Here's what we're told. Is rejoice in the Lord always. Find joy in Jesus. And I know that sounds really, really churchy. But let's explain that. Let's explain how to rejoice always. Let's explain how to discover and find joy in Jesus. So that when this world that is so cruel to us. When it shows us the worst it has to offer. And when it knocks us down. We can move unfazed. And it starts with remembering. Remember who Jesus is. Remember who Jesus is. And remember what Jesus has done. Remember who Jesus is and remember what Jesus has done. Rejoice in the Lord. And you say, but you don't know my circumstances. You don't know the diagnosis I've been given. You don't know what the doctor said to me. You don't know how I spent this week. You don't know the meeting that I just had to have with my business partners or what my lawyers said to me or the arguments that I've had all week with my wife or the kids. They're just making such horrible decisions. You don't know what's going on in my circumstances. You don't know. So it can be easy for you to say rejoice in the Lord. And it's great that the Bible of all places tells us to rejoice in the Lord. But you don't know my circumstances. And while that may be true, I want you to know you're not alone and you're not the first person to experience hardship. While these words were written, the setting for this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi was a jail cell. He sat in jail. can't help but imagine that from the edge of the jail floor where he sat, he took out a scroll and a pen, and he wrote down, rejoice in the Lord always. Some of you feel right now like you're in prison. Some of you have been dealt a hand we wouldn't wish upon anyone. 
and our hearts break for what you're experiencing, as they should. And this isn't to say that if you, just, if you just say some mantra in your mind that I choose today to rejoice in Jesus, that everything's going to be perfect and happy and things are just going to magically go better. But it is to say when you have a proper focus, your outlook improves. And if the words rejoice in the Lord always could be written by a man thrown in jail, then they can be applied in our lives. And so no matter what you're facing, step back and remember who Jesus is and what he's done for you. And it doesn't mean that everything's going to be magically fixed and all of a sudden life is going to become easy, but it is a healthy dose of perspective. And it helps. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. In life, don't be easily shaken. And we live, we live in a culture right now that loves outrage. They love outrage. It's a drug. You can't do or say anything without upsetting someone. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you fall on. You cannot do or say anything without upsetting someone. Everyone loves to be a victim and everyone loves to be outraged. We live in a world right now that is just drunk on outrage. And people love to play that card. That I'm offended. I'm upset. And what we're called to be as people who follow Jesus is we're called to be reasonable. And in years past, this wouldn't seem that extreme. Be be reasonable. Well, that makes sense. But we live in a time right now where where being outraged is the norm. And so we have to make sure that we stop ourselves from that. And we choose instead to be reasonable people. And that that is known to everyone. So that everyone who looks at us sees that we are not easily shaken. We don't lose control. That we're reasonable people. And how, how can we be reasonable people in a world that literally has lost its mind? How can we be reasonable people in an age of outrage where everyone loves to be outraged at everything? And it's to remember, God's in control. God's in control. God's got this. You may not see it right now when you look at everything that's going on. You may think, well, this world's headed for disaster. If you've read the book, you already knew that. (laughs) I don't know why you're surprised. It's nothing new, and there's been a spoiler alert for a couple thousand years of where we're headed. So, relax. God isn't quivering. God isn't quaking. God's got this. And if you're a follower of Jesus, God's got you. So take a deep breath. It doesn't matter who the president is. It doesn't matter who the president will be. It doesn't matter the laws that are... It doesn't matter. God's in control. But people make a lot of money. And people get a lot of votes. By highlighting outreach. And as people who follow Jesus, we just need to make sure that we don't fall for it. And we make sure that we are reasonable people, that everyone who looks at us sees that we are not easily moved. We are not easily shaken. Save the drama for your mama and relax. Relax. 
Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Anxiety comes from life. It just does. It's three o'clock in the morning and everyone else in the house is asleep. Except you. Dancing through your mind. It's that pressure from work. You can't shake it. You can't escape it. It doesn't matter how many podcasts you listen to. Tonight, you're not sleeping. Anxiety lives there. It lives within you. It's four o'clock. The day is finally here. They've given you all the odds. They've talked to you about what could happen. And in an hour, you're going to get up and you're going to head into surgery. And it may just be a statistic for them, but for you, you may never open your eyes again. There's that trepidation and that fear as you hug your spouse just a little longer and you fight back the tears trying not to let them see how scared and anxious you really are. And they try to hold back theirs knowing that it probably won't be, but it could be the last time they ever speak to you. You head in to have your procedure. It's 6 a.m. You couldn't sleep a wink last night. Because this is the person of your dreams. And you are so excited to walk down the aisle and declare that for the rest of your life you're going to be with them. And yet, you know. You know that anymore there's just no guarantees. And you've seen people that you thought would make it no matter what, and it's not been the case. You're getting ready to start a whole new life together. At seven, you head off to work. You thought you were going to be retired. You thought that with your investments and social security, you'd be set. And by now, you wouldn't be heading into work. And yet, you're heading there. Because the can't miss investment missed. Social security just isn't enough to get you by. And you're anxious. Anxiety comes from life. And it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. It doesn't mean that you don't love Jesus enough. It means you're human. And yet, there's hope. And there's a promise. And so when Paul writes, be anxious about nothing. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. What he's saying is anxiety comes from life. Anxiety doesn't have to define your life. Anxiety comes from life, but anxiety doesn't have to define your life. And those of us who follow Jesus, he's given us a way to let go. A way that we don't have to let anxiety define our lives. And that is to give it 
Whatever situation and circumstances we find ourselves in, to give that over to God. I've taken my car into the mechanic numerous times for different repairs because I understood a long time ago, while I'm willing to attempt repairs on something like a back door of a garage, that a car is a different animal, and I'm just, I don't have what it takes. And I'm not ashamed to admit that. What I've noticed in a lot of repair shops is a sign that is posted very prominently. And it's a sign that says, due to federal or state or local law, whatever the case may be, you aren't allowed past this point. Which is really just a convenient way for the repair shop to keep you out of their way. Because the last thing they want is you bringing your car into them and then you trying to tell them how to fix your car. They're the experts. They don't want your perspective. Drop off your car. Get a ride. Some of them will even take you to work just to get you out of there. How many of us, with our problems, take them to God? And then try to explain to God how he needs to fix it. And instead of just letting go, and stepping back, we try to engage in every step of the process. This is a message for us to let go. You know what I've discovered about those repair shops, the same ones that have those signs posted, you can't come back here, is the vast majority of them, as soon as my car is fixed, take me right through that door and show me what they fixed. They just didn't want me back there in the process. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're experiencing. I don't know what's causing you anxiety. I don't know what's making you anxious. I don't know the trouble of your life specifically. But here's what I know. You don't have to walk through it alone. You don't have to carry it. Let God carry it for you. Let God fix it. Give it to him. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This prayer reminds us. It reminds us that God is bigger than us. It reminds us that God is greater than our circumstances. It reminds us that God is greater than everything we see going on around us. And it offers us something that is in short supply. Peace. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It will literally guard our hearts. The peace of God will guard our minds so that the things that make us lose all the sleep, the things that keep us up at night, the things that make us so anxious, God will guard us against that. But here's the deal. If God needs to guard us, that means that we're engaged in a battle. That means there's a very real threat. You don't guard things you aren't worried about. You don't guard things that people aren't going to try to break in or attack. If something needs guarded, it means there's a real threat. The anxieties of this world will attack your heart. They will attack your mind. And they are relentless. And with apologies to all the fine insurance agents out there now, if you don't think there's enough to worry about, just step into an insurance agent's office. And they'll be selling you policies for things you're like, I didn't even think about that. (laughs) 
There are a million things to worry about. And it's not just insurance agents. Lay in bed and all of a sudden you feel something in your knee. You're like, there's a tumor. <laughs> like you sleep wrong on your arm. You're like, well, it's getting cut off tomorrow. <laughs> it's gone. We're constantly inundated with all of these fears and all of these things to worry about. Our hearts and our minds are under attack with the stresses and the worries of this world. And those of us who are following Jesus, God is telling you today, there's a better way. There's a better way. Hey, remember, we've already talked about it. You're going to die. I mean, you are. None of us are getting out of here alive. And the world's going to hell in a handbasket, as Scripture told us it's going to. So none of this should be new. The question is, what do we do with this information? We can either worry or we can give it over to Jesus. I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm not big enough to control all this stuff. I'm not strong enough, so I'm choosing to give it over to God. That's my choice. And I'm going to allow the peace of God to guard my heart and to guard my mind. Instead of worry, I choose peace. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And this is the invitation to change your mindset. To change your mindset. Now listen. I know for some of you, anxiety is a way of life. And professional help or medication is part of God's plan for your solution. And there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. Our brains are just like any other part of our body. They can get sick. Things can go haywire. That doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you spiritually. I want to be very clear about that. And for some of you, that is part of God's process within you of guarding your mind. is is help through a professional and through medication. That is part of this solution. But for all of us, it's time to change our perspective. And it's time for us to remember who Jesus is and remember what Jesus has done. And I don't just mean that from a theological point of view where we go through Scripture and we remember all that God has, all that God has done historically. I wanna, I wanna, that's a great place to start, but I want to move it to a personal level. Let's change our mindset. So right now, on, on the phone, exit, exit the Bible app just for a minute and, and start a note. And, and if your phone or your tablet isn't up, then just pull the pen down. It, you should have a pen in front of you. And if you don't have something to write with, you can, you can either write on your hand or your arm or, or the connection card in front of you or your pants. Whatever you want to write with, that's fine. Uh, but but pull, out, pull out your phone or your tablet and the pen and something to write with. And we're just going to change our perspective right now. And we're going to remember who God is and we're going to remember who Jesus is and what God has done for us and what Jesus has done for us. And right now, I'm just going to count to 10. And every time I I put out a number, I want you to list a blessing. We are going to count your blessings literally. And you say, Brian, you don't know what I have going on in my life. You don't know what I've been. No, 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 no. I understand. It's been a horrible week or it's been a horrible month or it's been a horrible year or it's been a horrible decade. I get it. I'm a Cleveland Browns fan. All right. I understand. (laughs) Suffering can last for what seems like forever. But right now, we're going to change our mindset. And one of the best ways to do that is to remember 
who God is and what he's done, and not just theologically, but personally. So we're going to count our blessings. One. Two. Three. Four. Six. Seven. Ten. When the hardness of this world tries to shake you, and the fear mounts, and the anxiety sets in, you remember who Jesus is. You remember what Jesus has done. When you take that anxiety, you take that stress, and you offer it to him. He's got you. You don't have to carry this. Choose joy. Choose peace. And I want to challenge you every day this week, every day this week, you start or you end or wherever you're most productive. At some point, you take time where you're just quiet with a phone or a pen journal, whatever the case may be for you. You count your blessings literally. You refuse to forget all that God has done for you. God, guard our hearts. Guard our minds. Give us peace. I pray that we would stop trying to carry the load by ourselves. I pray we would stop trying to go through this life alone. I pray that we would trust you. We would hand
hand these things to you. And we'd keep our hands off. And let you go to work. That we would choose to rejoice in you, who you are, and what you've done. Historically, theologically, but also God personally. And God, that we would be able to arrive to a point where we could say we are anxious for nothing. But we give it to you. Change our perspective. Change our minds. Help us. We ask in your son Jesus' name.